Okay, well, I'll go ahead and um, begin with our land acknowledgement. The archaeological research facility is located in Huchin, the ancestral and unceded territory of Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and made attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance and practice in support of Ohlone, Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native and Indigenous people. So um, I'd like to turn it over to Albert Gonzalez from Cal State East Bay to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Nico. You can hear me okay? Yes. So thanks to the R for inviting me to introduce the speaker. And thanks, I see a lot of my students in the room. That's fantastic from Cal State East Bay. Thanks especially to the students of archaeological science and uh, archaeology of the Americas. This talk is pretty relevant for what we're doing in our course in, in this very moment, in fact, in our course syllabi. So, so glad to see that you're all here. And I'm so glad to see that everyone um, is here. So Jordi Rivera Prince and I met as a result of a talk that I gave at Columbia a couple of years back that touched on Latinidad, indigeneity, practitioner positionality, and community. Topics that she and I have now discussed at length in the context of both our areas of research. My conversations and communication with the speaker have been nothing short for me of inspiring, especially as it comes to researcher positionality and what it means to carry out meaningful work with descendant communities in Latin America and Latinx America. So I'm honored to introduce again, Jordi Rivera Prince. She's a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Florida. She did her undergraduate work at Penn and has worked for the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. She's a, get this, received Ford Foundation, Fulbright, NSF, and Wintergren support for research that draws techniques of biological and mortuary archaeology together to analyze the emergence of social inequality in the ancient Andes. In this talk, she pays special attention to the processes by which inequality becomes embodied and expressed in material culture. Her project engages, in, engages local descendant communities, including fishermen and shell gatherers in Huanchaco, Peru. The site itself is located inside an elementary school there where her team has delivered lessons on Huanchaco archaeological history and has even drawn students into the archaeological, into archaeological practice there. This is what I mean by meaningful community engagement. So please join me in welcoming her, welcoming her to the ARC to deliver her talk entitled Social Inequality, Perspectives from Peru's Late Early Horizon and Present Day Archaeological Practice. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen real quick. You guys can see everything okay? All right. Um, I'm also notoriously bad for missing like hand raising and the chats and stuff. So if there's any problems, just feel free to like unmute and talk at me. Um, so thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I am virtually joining, but from San Francisco, um, but I just wanted to state that I'm in solidarity with the graduate student workers who are striking right now. Um, and I also wanted to preface this with that there are photos of human remains and associated burial objects um, in the following presentation. I did use drawings when possible and I will give advance notice before any of the pictures come up. Um, social inequality has, to me, uh, the more I do research, become really clear that it's kind of elusive. There's no very clear definition of what it is or how to operationalize it in archaeology. Um, but the definition that I've been using in my own research and that I use throughout this presentation is the organizing structure in human society. Social inequality is manifest in unequal access to goods, information, decision making, and power. And the thing about social inequality is that I, I believe and others have argued that it is both spatially and temporally specific. And what I mean by that is that where you are and what time period you're in is going to impact how social inequality is expressed. So therefore, when we're doing research on social inequality, it's important to look at the degree and forms of social inequality within a given community or society, um, and also look for ways how it was obtained and also who benefits from social inequality, because that's also going to change from place to place. Um, when it comes to investigating social inequality in the past, there's two approaches that we can use with archaeology and bioarchaeology methods. There's a bio biological perspective, 
Um, there has been research that's shown not only just in bioarchaeology, but also in contemporary societies that inequality can become embodied. For example, Lance Gravely showed how race, racial inequality became embodied literally in the biological well-being of racialized groups of um, and individuals. Um, we can also look in archaeology or in present day at material um, lived conditions. So for example, social inequality from a resource perspective, who has what when we're doing this research, but also thinking about other things that might not be actually materially tangible, such as time. Um, so where are people investing time and um, also in present day can look at things like money. Um, these can be influenced and shaped not only by your individual choices, but as well as community structure. And although we're always trying to kind of get at that social, um, we never get the full picture, we get pieces of it. And um, what I'm interested in looking in is, at is we do have the tools to get at aspects of social inequality, um, biologically speaking, with bioarchaeology in the past, and also materially through archaeology or mortuary archaeology in my, um, my own case. But how do you get into this overlap and make them speak to one another? Um, and the way that I've been approaching this in my own work is through the theory, theoretical perspective is the body as material culture. Um, there is an excellent book on it by Sofair 2006. Um, it's not necessarily a methodology, but more so a perspective and orientation to the body. Um, typically in the literature, the skeleton or the body itself gets conceptualized either as a biological entity or a cultural entity. And looking at the body's material culture, you don't need this division. You don't need the separation. You can body as the product. And you can also see that we navigate the world and manipulate our environment. Our environment also shapes us and impacts us as well. Um, the skeleton itself is what's left over in the archaeological record and what we can see as the material remnant of what it was once the biological living body. And by analyzing the skeleton and the different clues that are present in it, we can look at things, for example, like activity patterns, we can look at labor, we can look at what people were eating, and we can even look at aspects of care um, throughout life and during childhood in the past. So bringing this to where I work, I work in the Central Andes, specifically on the north coast of Peru in South America. Um, when looking at research in the past prior to, I mean, I feel like most people are familiar with the Inca and know the Inca, um, but looking even further past that to where, when I work, which is prior to like basically from 100 BC to zero, there's long been interest in looking at the emergence of complexity, um, which again, another term that's kind of like means a lot of things all at once. Um, but a lot of people focus their investigations on monumental mm -hmm. sites and locations of power. Um, in the Central Andes, there are many monumental sites that are super cool and super impressive. Um, but one of the questions that myself and others have been left with is, but what about regular people? What are people in these, in these places of power, in these locations of power, they get this power because of the rest of the people who kind of legitimize that. And so one of the responses to this from a theoretical and methodological perspective has been um, household archeology, span uh, which was first, I guess mostly popularized in um, Mesoamerica and looking at my households. And that has also been done in the central Andes um, as kind of what we call like the bottom up approach. But one of the things that I'm interested in as well that household archeology span doesn't necessarily get at is the people themselves that were living during these time periods and who have all of these clues about what their, their environment and what their social lives might've been like written on their bodies. To also give some context on what's going on from an, an equity perspective at this po point in time, um, there are two kind of major peaks or moments around this time period. One is um, the Chavin uh, or Chavin de, uh, the Chavin sphere of influence. There's many different ways of being referred to it, but Chavin was kind of centered at the site of Chavin de Cuentad. Um, it emerged around 800 BC and collapsed around 500 or 400 BC, depending on who you ask. Um, but Chivin de Cuentar is important because it was conceptualized as a broadly Pan-Indian religious tradition. Um, ideology and the religion itself was controlled through the manipulation and circulation of religious beliefs, primarily through iconography, and then also people making pilgrimages up to the highlands to the site of Chivin de Cuentar. So that's one side, one bookend. 
Then if you fast forward about 600 years later, you see the emergence of the moche. And the moche are pretty well known on the north coast of Peru. Um, they emerged in the moche valley, which is also where I do my work. Um, the moche, you have a what has been argued to be um, one of the first states of South America that is also debated. But importantly, you do see the emergence of stratified society and class-based society. Chivin, on the other hand, was more of a top-down approach where power was very much centrally concentrated. And there was um, a few or small groups of elites that would then control power and ideology and the manipulation of this movement. So for example, um, something from around the time period of Chivin from the early horizon time period would be the site of Paco Pampa. It's also in the highlands. Um, and there they've recovered a woman they've named the Dama de Paco Pampa who was buried adorned with gold and all of these other important objects. Um, but we don't necessarily have any recovery of commoners or regular people from that site. Whereas at the Moche, you get people from all different sides of the spectrum. You get people who are farmers or peasants, and then you also get the very rich elite priests and priestesses as they call them. So what's going on in between those two? How do you get from this top-down approach to a class-based society? And that, and getting at like what happened in between um, would be require looking at either what we call the Salinar, the Salinar is kind of elusive. Um, it's still debated whether or not it's, it's technically an archeological culture, but a lot of debate centers on, is it a culture? Is it um, a time period? What's the best way to think about it? Um, so I will use Salinar interchangeable also with the late early horizon. So specifically I'm talking about after the collapse of Chivin um, around 400 BC and like between there and zero. Um, the early horizon, especially after the collapse of Jabin, is notoriously difficult to kind of pin down, particularly because it's characterized by all of this major social transition. So some of the things that we see is the emergence, proliferation, and collapse of Chibin, like I was talking about, we see a dramatic increase in urbanization and also settlement reorganization. So typically people were living in the valleys or in the coast, uh, in the the bottom of the valleys of the foothills of the Andes are on the coast. And you see this dramatic reorganization to people living in larger groups, but then also going up into the um, higher up into the foothills of the Andes. You also see in the south of the uh, in the south of Peru and in the south of the Andes, you see increasing complexity in the Altiplano. You also see more defensive sites that are being built. Um, and it's been hypothesized that there is a a lot of increasing social conflict at this period of time. You also see abandonment of monumental architecture like that of Chibi de Cuantar. You also see dramatic changes in food patterns and also extensive trade and exchange between the coast and the highlands and even beyond. So for example, um, near the site that I've been researching, we found some of the earliest evidence of cacao, um, which would have come from the Amazon. So you can see that that trade and exchange is happening over some very significant and impressive distances. Um, the site that I've been doing my research at is called La Iglesia. Um, it is a late early horizon cemetery from a small scale fishing community. It's located in the present day town of Juan Chaco in the Moche Valley on the north coast of Peru. Um, it's about 11 kilometers north of the Plaza de Armas of Trujillo, which is the second largest city in Peru. Um, and it's literally right on the beach. Like when we're digging, it's pretty nice. I feel very spoiled. Like you can just like look out and, you know, see the sun over the water. It's very nice. Um, but the thing about La Iglesia itself is why I think it's an ideal place to kind of research social inequality and getting at these questions is that oftentimes fishing communities have been um, constituted as being um, modest communities, um, not having much, being kind of like lower on, on the rank, so to speak, when also considering larger sites, either urban sites or monumental sites. Um, so to me, I'm really interested in looking at, you know, kind of just regular people and also looking within that, the diversity of what people's lived experiences were like. Um, also, there are some archeologists who have argued for social inequality during this time period, during the Salinar, but a lot of this evidence has come primarily from settlement patterns themselves and also architecture. And one of the things that I think 
we would do well by looking beyond is like one buildings and architecture and so on patterns are like great sources of information but again you're missing the people themselves and i also think that when thinking about settlement patterns and architecture and construction and things like that or even conquest um trying to reflect on who we subconsciously think of when we're researching that in the past um to me and maybe this is my own bias but when i think about construction and conquest and terms like that i almost subconsciously think about men and that like is almost like a very masculine perspective of things to focus on. Whereas if we look at bioarchaeology and look at cemeteries and look at all the people that are involved, um, it's also possible to get the perspectives from women and also from children in the past. To give an idea also of what it looks like, the site, we are literally in the middle of Juan Chaco. Um, it's a little hard to see with this little red arrow here is pointing at the Iglesia Colonial de Juan Chaco. Um, and the site itself, we don't know how far it actually extends. It likely goes throughout most of what is Juan Chaco today. Um, but where we're digging is, uh, it's a little difficult to see, but right here you can, there are what, like retaining walls that are um, blocking off the elementary school. It is a public elementary school. Um, and then there's an area uh, that's vacant of structures that's also bounded by a, um, like a, a soccer, I guess the soccer field, it's made out of concrete, but um, the students do come out during recess while we're digging and it gets a little crazy, but it's also very exciting and very fun. Um, based on ceramic analyses, the site itself does have continuous occupation from the initial period, which is about um, 1800 BC, all the way through the colonial period. So there is a very long occupational history here and it does overlap with the Salinar, um, the Salinar period. There are, to date, we think there's about three different occupational phases. Um, one where the cemetery began, then the construction of U-shaped ritual structures facing north towards a mountain called Cerro Campana. Um, and Cerro Campana is very important because in Indian beliefs, there has long been the a, a respect for mountains as both protectors and people who and and basically people, uh, entities of personhood who look over and protect. And so that's significant to me that working there to be within the gaze of Cerro Campana is very important. Um, and then finally, in the last phase, there was uh, of more bodies that were buried and then also large storage vessels, um, ollas that are like literally over a meter tall. Like when you hold it, you have to like, it's like hard to even walk with them. That would have been storage containers, likely for chicha or maize beer. So there's a lot of things that have been found here that are super cool. And this has all been part of a project with um, the Programa Arqueológico de Juan Chaco, which I've been a team member of for the past, oh my goodness, like five years. Um, and the lead PI is Dr. Gabriel Prieto. So it's an amazing project to be a part of because the team is huge and there's so many different interesting perspectives and specialists to be in dialogue with. Um, I have been focusing specifically uh, on the bioarchaeological analyses. So here's a brief representation of the demographics so far. And just to kind of what to take away from this, I have collapsed um, female and possible female sex estimations together and male and possible male sex estimations together. Um, and I'll maintain that throughout the rest of the presentation as well. But what's notable here is that not only do we have infants and children and adults that are present, we also have roughly equal representation of um, male and female individuals. And of the male and female adults, they also um, have representation throughout the different um, age ranges and life stages. So to me, this is really cool because the cemetery has a representation of people from all different social identities. Um, previous cemeteries that have been dug of the Salinar, there's only two others that I'm personally aware of. Um, one of them has a very high adult male bias. So to me, this is interesting because it opens a new avenue to kind of explore what life was like for people in the past, um, specifically during Salinar. And now shifting to the burial representations, I am going to show the pictures of human remains now. Um, what I was interested in looking at was for evidence of, it's been hypothesized that there were um, a, a range of social identities, uh, so to speak, that there was like a regular, uh, a middle, and then the elites. But again, that was from mostly from the architectural layout of houses. And so here, 
I was trying to find evidence for not just ends of the spectrum or extremes, but also looking for social identities in the middle. So one individual that would be an example of kind of someone who is buried in a very simple grave is this individual, IG 357. And this person was buried with no grave goods, um, basically just put into the sand. It's also very sandy and very dry here. So things fall apart a lot um, once you get down this deep. Then someone who would be kind of in the middle or intermediate would be this one, 277. And this individual was buried with a bottle, but then also with a fragment of an olla. And so you can see here, it's not nothing, but it's not super elaborate. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have someone like this. So 274, this person was a middle adult male at the time of death. Um, so roughly around like 30 years to 40 years. Um, he was buried with a lot of um, fine wares. He was also buried with, um, that are in the traditional white on red um, ceramics that we see for the Selinar. And then you can also see that he was buried with an antero, which is, um, oh goodness, uh, like a, a, pan, a, a flute. And then also butos or like little spindle whorls. Um, he was also buried with a complete dog. And this is something that's interesting about the cemetery is like not only are people buried with dogs, but dogs have their own discrete burials. And we also have found um, an elaborate stone carving that looks to be in the shape of a bird. Um, there's red pigment that's inside the little crevice there in the center. And then he was also buried with little um, squares of gold that were perforated, uh, as well as next to the right hand, there was um, a wooden hand that also had gold in it. So a lot of range of diversity and the types of things he's being buried with, gold being a precious metal um, historically throughout the Andes. So this is very notable. Um, it's also notable because for such a quote unquote modest fishing community, it's pretty clear that we have some very important goods that are being buried here and associated with people. So again, this is kind of challenging how we think about fishing communities on, on the coast of the Central Andes. Another person that I think is important to talk about is this individual, IG 433. Um, this is actually an elderly woman. She was over 45 years at the time of death. And she was also, the picture is a little bit hard to see, um, but she was also buried with the white on red ceramics. She was also buried with a dog and she was buried with what was to me, one of the coolest things that I've found so far um, in the excavations that I've done is an ariguera or um, a nose ornament. And so it basically sits in the nose, like it wouldn't have been pierced and it would have been decorative. Uh, she was likely wearing it at the time of burial. And you can see all along the rim, um, that it's decorated with these waves. Um, so not only is this very impressive and super cool and very beautiful, it also shows a diversity even within those who have these elaborate goods. So for example, with the other individual, the gold was square um, and just hammered out, whereas this is a very elaborate and would have taken more skill to create. Um, and so even within the gold, for example, you see a diversity in skill and investment. Um, one of the things that I think is also very interesting is that um, we're calling people like this, uh, quote unquote, local elites. And one of the things that's very interesting is of the seven that we've identified so far, uh, four of them are, are, are elderly women. Um, the, when men are buried like this, they have various age ranges, but it's always elderly women. Um, and they were buried not only in elaborate tombs in terms of what they're presented with, but even with adobe lined um, tombs that are like, it's some of this, like just super impressive. And it would have taken a lot of time and effort to build. And furthermore, their old age suggests to me at least that there's an element of community care and investment. And it also suggests to me that perhaps they were seen as wise, knowledgeable, and potentially from that getting power and respect as figures within their community. Um, another thing that I was interested in, so going specifically to the analyses themselves, um, I don't have time to dive into everything, but one of the more interesting analyses that I've done so far is a study of the trauma. Um, there's 93 total individuals that I've analyzed from the cemetery, and there's only three studies of trauma on the North Coast from this time period so far. And not only 
has it been hypothesized that this time period was a time of elevated conflict? Um, it has also been, conflict itself has been suggested as one of the driving forces for the emergence of statehood and for the emergence of quote unquote the Moche state. So I was really interested in looking at, is there evidence for this community when you have this diverse representation of burial goods and how people are being represented in death? Do we have evidence of interpersonal trauma or any sort of suggestion of warfare or conflict for these people. So in this, my guiding objectives were to determine the prevalence of interpersonal and then what I call other trauma, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and But also throughout the whole body, there tends to be a bias in Andean bioarchaeology to look at cranial trauma only um, for evidence of tr interpersonal trauma. But in my opinion, and and as others have argued, trauma can happen anywhere in the body. So I was really interested in looking at the holistic person. And then I was also interested in looking at who might exhibit uh, more interpersonal and other trauma based on age and sex. So are there only young men or is it only elderly men, um, et cetera? So again, the sex estimations were collapsed in this and I have the age estimations into seven age ranges. Um, I categorize physical trauma based as interpersonal or accidental or unknown based on a lot of different factors, including the trauma type, location, severity, and the stage of healing. So for example, uh, blunt force trauma to the frontal bone that hadn't healed to me would indicate likely interpersonal trauma or um, a fracture to the mid shaft of the ulna to me would be categorized as a defensive wound, which would also be interpersonal trauma. Um, and I also included um, healed and non healed trauma within this. Um, and then also for accidental or unknown, an example of that would be, uh, for example, I have an individual who has a crushing had a healed crushed fracture to the distal phalanx of his thumb. So basically like smashed his finger. Um, and it didn't affect necessarily their survival and it healed. And so while it potentially could have been interpersonal to me, like you can't really know. So I categorize that as um, accidental or unknown. So that I put in a histogram, which I'll show in a second. And then I also modeled instances of trauma with age, sex and their interaction using a binomial linear model to see if there was any of these um, individual identities that were perhaps more susceptible to interpersonal trauma. Um, so in this histogram, just to like brief, quickly explain, so on the x-axis, you can see the trauma count. So either zero, one, or two, there was no individual that had more than two instances of trauma um, that I recorded. And then on the uh, y-axis, you can see the number of individuals. So for example, in this box here, you can interpret it as in the age range of 36 to 50 years old, there was one individual who had one instance of interpersonal trauma. Um, so the main takeaway from this is that there is no evidence of trauma in children and young adults. And there's actually trauma really only in when you get into the middle and older adult age ranges. Uh, and then also the instance of interpersonal and other trauma. See, there's definitely a difference, but it's pretty roughly equal. And again, when you separate it out by sex, you can see that both male and female individuals have evidence of interpersonal trauma, but they also have instances of other trauma. And again, the rates are not super different. Um, only 10 people of the 93 had in instances of trauma, and that's all, all trauma total. So there's some overlap between the seven who had interpersonal trauma and the six who had other trauma. Um, and then when I modeled it, uh, I did find that age, sex, and the interaction between the two were not significant predictors of trauma. And furthermore, the demographic representation you would expect for a time characterized by trauma and conflict, you would expect to see perhaps um, high rates of young men with interpersonal trauma that was lethal or perhaps see um, a lack of young men because they were leaving and engaging in conflict. And for those different demographic representations you'd expect, we don't see that. So why I think this is interesting and significant is that you see people gaining status distinction at this time period, especially in La Iglesia, in the Jose Olaya sector. But the way that people traditionally think about gaining power and status and have argued for this time period doesn't seem to hold up. So to me, it suggests that something else is going on here. Um, and I'm hoping that with all the future analyses that I'm working through right now, as I write my dissertation, will also help explain this. Um, so I'm currently processing a lot of my data. I have collected data throughout the entire body um, instead of focusing on just one aspect of the body. Um, and this is mostly because I believe your body is holistic and it 
and it's your whole body that interacts with the world. It's not just um, one part, like it's not just the dentition, et cetera. So I'm looking throughout the whole body and I'm also I'm sending out samples for light and heavy stable isotope analysis um, very soon. And I'm also working on right now scoring everything with the burial goods so that I can do a principal component analysis. Um, and basically the idea would be to look at potential correlations with age and sex as uh, different social identities, but then also look at other potential indicators of embodied inequality that I'm finding in my data. Um, so that is my perspective on social inequality in the past. And then shifting now to social inequality and present day archeological practice. I think it's been, it's been clear for some people for a long time. And then even more recently in the past couple of years that inequities exist in present day archeological practice. And these inequities can be both in institutionalized um, but also individually enacted. So, here I'm framing my talk uh, based on a article that will come out literally any day um, called An Intersectional Approach to Equity and Equity in Archaeology, a Pathway Through Community. Um, I led this paper with a group of amazing community of co-authors, um, and it should be coming out in the next issue of Advances in Archaeological Practice. Um, this paper came about from a seminar that we did on equity and archeological practice that was actually hosted at the University of Maine um, in the spring semester of 2021. There was 30 of us in the seminar. Um, it was a combination of professionals and students and not even everybody in the seminar was an archeologist. Um, and of course we didn't address every aspect of inequity and equity in archeological practice, but it was um, a very productive learning space together. And if anyone's interested in more information on what we talked about and how we made the seminar happen, um, a subset of us did put out an article in the SA Archaeological Record in the May edition um, based on the seminar. And um, we also did translate it into Spanish to make it more accessible. So I'm following the uh, framework that we outlined in this paper of looking at how inequity and equity affects archaeologists through these four different themes of individual community theory and practice. And one of the things we argue is that you can't look at any of these discreetly, that they all interrelate with one another and affect each other. And we talked about individuals and communities. I feel like you can't separate them fully because we all have intersecting identities and based on those identities we might belong to or be parts of different communities so just speaking for myself um, I'm a Mexican a Mexican American woman of color um, and I come from a low-income background and so there's a certain level of solidarity and community I can find with other for example low, uh, archaeologists that come from a low-income background but I might not always share solidarity with other aspects of my identity so it's important to recognize that that we can be parts of all of these different communities, but still hold all of our identities together. Um, I think our individual community identities have an impact on um, how, how things play out in archaeology through power and class differentials. So, for example, one of the things that's very pertinent to me as someone who is from the United States but is practicing in archaeology in Peru is thinking about north-south relations and the pow inherent power differentials that are at play there. Um, but then also not only just with Peruvian archaeologists, but also with the community that we do our research with. And then also thinking about class differentials. And with that, I mean, um, there are certain opportunities and training and things that you can get involved with as an archaeologist, but some of them cost a lot of money, for example, field schools. Um, and to me, for example, field schools were a prohibitive cost and it wasn't something that I actually did. And so recognizing that inequity and access to these opportunities can therefore limit opportunities that people can take and get that training for. Um, depending on your communities and, and your identities as an individual, there can also be barriers such as language barriers. And so again, just using examples from my work working in Peru, um, there's barriers not only just in uh, archaeologists from North America working in Peru who can't speak Spanish, but then also not reading the Spanish language literature that's there, um, not citing Spanish literature on different time periods and topics and sites that people are working at. But then there's also the flip side of um, Peruvian archaeologists who may not necessarily 
be fluent in English or like have the opportunity to learn English and then therefore don't have access to all the literature that we're publishing in English language platforms that are about their history and their heritage. I also think language barriers are not limited just to, for example, like English Spanish. Um, I also have like experienced language barriers in my own, um, in terms of like my own vernacular and like the colloquialisms that I use. Um, I find like, for example, back home, people might think that like when I'm talking about my research, I talk really fancy. And so like also the inequities that exist in perhaps prejudice and judgment that might happen based on how someone talks or their accent or how they carry themselves in speaking. Um, and then also uh, accessibility. So that goes beyond so many different things. So for example, accessibility in terms of archeologists uh, who have disabilities and making field work accessible to them, but also accessibility in terms of recognizing that some people when they're training and in, in school and studying and things like that, like might be caregivers, might be parents and how that also will limit their opportunities to get um, experience and be active in the archeological community. And super quickly, uh, just to even show how this kind of trickles all the way up is even if you don't go into academia or become a research archeologist, um, you're still getting trained by people who do get PhDs in order to teach. And in the survey burn doctorate, doctorates from the NSF um, in 2019, there was 117 PhDs in archeology span awarded. And even though we have rough gender parity, and this isn't perfect because the NSF only collects um, assuming a gender binary, um, there's rough gender parity, but when you look at the racial breakdown, um, there is 72 to 0.6% of the PhDs were awarded to white individuals. And so when this comes to hiring people as professors and other jobs that require a PhD, it's really hard to diversify when you're not having a high representation of individuals receiving these degrees for those opportunities. And again, speaking with language accessibility, one of the things that um, we can do is to work beyond the boundaries of the university system um, or like the boundaries of the universe, the metaphorical university wall. Um, so one of the things that like, for example, I've done in my work is I've collaborated with the Berkeley um, Aurea Center and I made a teaching kit on my research that is accessible to middle and high school social studies classrooms. So it's used in accessible language that teachers can use. And then it was also, I translated it into Spanish so that it can also be accessible in both languages and then in that different type of vocabulary that's more accessible to the public. Um, thinking about theory, it also guides like what is acceptable to study. Um, theory guides what, what we're what we're researching, the questions we ask and the methods we use, which also is uh, tied up with who is accessible acceptable to study and which questions can be asked. Um, and so one of the things that has been changing and that I have a lot of hope for is a lot of people have been recognizing the validity and using more relational ontologies, which I think is super cool and promising. Um, but again, with the question of what, what and who is acceptable to study and my experience, um, I, as I mentioned, I'm Mexican American, I work in Peru, I've been questioned before, not in a malicious way in any way, but just questioned about why do I work in Peru if I'm Mexican, why wouldn't I work in Mexico? But I also know that my colleagues have likely never been asked that question before. Um, and also related to this, just speaking from a bioarchaeological standpoint, um, in a paper written by Rachel Watkins, um, she makes this really important point that there's a longer history of a critical mass of people of color being involved in bioarchaeological research as subjects in the form of the skeletal data studied than as knowledge producers. And so to me, this also is very pertinent to me as a bioarchaeologist and a woman of color, um, the inherent power dynamic that comes in the history of the study and in the methods that we use. And lastly, I know I'm running out of time, um, but talking about practice, there is, a limitless number of ways we can talk about this, but especially pertinent to this is talking about um, field work and field schools. So not just when you get the training, but also when you're on the job is, are you working in an environment where you feel safe? And this can take many different ways. Are there practices in place and policies in place to help protect um, archeologists from sexual harassment or from being racially profiled in the field? And do people feel like they're given the opportunities to advocate for themselves if they need accommodations and that those concerns are taken seriously and that they're supported? Um, also thinking about practice with publishing and 
citational politics. So not only who gets to publish and where they get to publish, um, and that even takes into account things like cost, it's very expensive to publish, but also think about citational politics and who gets cited and how that is also a way of legitimizing what is quote unquote valid archeological knowledge and how that gets perpetuated. Um, and then also thinking about mentorship um, instead of thinking about, I mean, mentorship relationships inherently do have a, a different a differential power dynamic, but also being open to thinking about where as a mentor, we can learn more. Um, we're not gonna be perfect about knowing how to best mentor people from all different identities, but being open to that learning and to having a relationship where you also learn from your mentee and that it's an iterative process. And so a last example of this, especially with the publishing is um, there's a paper uh, by Laura Hestow about who writes about archaeology. And this is a lot of numbers, but the most important thing to talk about is even though we have increasing diversity and representation of who is a practicing archaeologist and who's publishing, um, there's still nearly 80% uh, of the people who are publishing are straight, white, cisgender men and women. And so even though we're doing this excellent work to get more diverse perspectives into the field, um, there's still more change that needs to happen further down the process. So looking forward, um, I think it's important, especially in the past with archaeology and looking at social inequality, is moving beyond a deficit-based theory. So in, what I mean by that is instead of looking at the elites and what they have and what makes them special, and then what the regular people don't have, is looking at when you're researching, quote unquote, just everyday lives of regular people, looking at what they have that allows them to survive, like what gives them more community and gives them the success and resilience to continue. And then also moving beyond the exceptional. And so uh, there too, what I mean is um, not just looking at places of power, but also looking beyond just the exception, for example, women who are exceptional or um, extraordinary circumstances in the archeological record that it's okay to just look at a regular person and what they have to share with us about the past. Um, and then in terms of present day practice, I think that we can really consider power and resource reallocation, um, looking to our workplaces, whether we're in the private sector and academia, um, and looking for areas of improvement, looking where students and early career researchers are lacking basic resources to succeed. And I don't think archaeology is the only place that has this problem. Um, in my belief, I don't think people get pushed out of archaeology when they're practicing necessarily or when they're in their PhD programs or in a 400 level class or in the field schools. I think people are getting pushed out much earlier before they even walk onto the campus of a college or university. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. There are so many people that I want to thank, um, but it would take a long time. Um, I do have my contact information on the QR code there, um, and I'm always happy if people reach out for emails um, with any questions or comments. So thank you. Thank you, Jordy. Yeah. Um, would you be willing to take questions and comments? Absolutely. Great. I'll stop sharing. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, use the raise hand function in Zoom if you'd like to unmute and ask a question. I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, I was wondering if you noticed differences in health and nutrition, and um, also in the uh, that divers the di the the ear effect yeah, from thanks. cold water diving. Yes, the external auditory, uh, the external auditory exostoses. I always get tripped up on that one. So yes, we do have them. But one of the things that's really interesting about those in particular is that I do have evidence of them and not just in adult males. So one of the things about them, for those who don't know, is it's a bony projection that forms basically right on the rim of your um, ear canal. And you typically get it from irritation, from exposure to cold water and cold wind. So a lot of times people call it surfer's ear. Um, even today, there's like plastic surgeons that specialize in removing them so that people can hear better. And they can get so big that they actually obstruct and make people deaf. Um, and so one of the things that I'm 
have found and I'm very interested in exploring further. And that was also why I was looking at the other trauma, accidental trauma, is that it does happen not just in adult males. Um, there are very few people in the whole population that, that I've studied that have it. So I will preface with that. But one of the things that's interesting is that then if it's in adult women, um, then it makes us need to like rethink what is their role in terms of what they're doing with the water. And so shell gatherers in general, a lot, I think a lot of people think of them as maybe being like knee deep in water, but there is actually now um, more ethno historic and ethnographic evidence that women are actually also diving. Um, so I think that looking at that evidence allows us to kind of challenge gender roles or like how people have traditionally thought about them. And then thinking about nutritional difference or like nutritional health and differences, there are. I am currently working through that data right now. So I'm not sure if the results are significant, but I will say there is differences in terms of people who, there is evidence of osteoporosis. Um, there is evidence of like cribral orbitalia and other nutritional deficiencies. I'm just not positive yet um, if those results are significant for any particular identity. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. There's a question. Um, I see, I'll, I'll read it, I guess. Uh, what is the end goal for people who are diving? Oh. Um, so for the people who are diving, they're tending to collect um, prominent in the diet are many different marine resources. So with divers, there's um, different like seashells and mollusks that people would be eating, but also um, seaweed, which is really good nutrition content. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Hastorf. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk. Uh, sorry, I couldn't get on the yeah. first three minutes. I don't know why it wasn't letting me. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I was late, but I, I wanted to um, sort of ask two things about your archeology. span um, Anyway, yeah. I'm joined very much. And one was about uh, the fisher folk uh, on the coast. Um, I'd like to know what data you, you're linking to when you say people are all saying that they're going to be sort of on the lower spectrum of access to goods and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or poor. Because if you remember George Goberman's paper, I mean, it's Moche times, it's yeah. slightly later, yeah. but he he really clearly has the fisher folk being pretty, you know, rich on the scale of things. They have all kinds of goodies like you're yeah. finding in burials. So I was quite excited to see your burials because he's yeah. he's finding them really. I mean, I don't want to get into classes, but they're obviously trading their stuff, whatever they're getting uh, mm -hmm. for nice things. And you're saying that, too. So I wanted to ask where you're getting the idea that fisher folk are poor uh maybe it's a solid our times and i just don't know that literature and the other thing is no i remember bob, bob benford's data and i'll shut up after this but bob benford had data no on divers down in the you know down near chilka and he, i think he had both men and women diving but again you probably mm -hmm. know that data so i'm gonna uh stop now thank you for your your comments and for your presentation Yes, thank you so much. Okay, so for the first question, where I've been kind of linking that discussion has been more so in looking at the initial period in the Kupusnike. So I think one of the problems that I've I, I've seen and that I'm trying to challenge as well is that I think a lot of people talk about the Salinar as explaining why the moche came to be. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do is instead of going that direction is to go earlier and then look at what is happening in the transition. So while yes, I definitely agree with you in terms of the Moche data, one of the things that I've been taking into context, so uh, Gabriel Prieto is my advisor. And so I'm like very familiar with his Gramalote data from, from that. And what he was finding at the site of Gramalote, which is also Kupisnike, the time period before, for those who don't know, um, the site is only a few kilometers to the south of mine. Um, and during the initial period, what he did find is that even though there's differential access um, within households, so he did the household archaeology perspective, that people still seem to be pretty equitable. And one of the questions that he was trying to explore and one of the things he was trying to challenge was that Gramalote itself was subservient or at least indebted to in some way to the Caballo Muerto complex in the middle Moche Valley. 
So one of the things that he found was not only that could people could farm there on the coast. Um, if you actually, it's not super hard to get to fresh water because the fresh water table is pretty high there. You can grow things. You, it's not definitely not intensive agriculture in the way you can do in the, in the valley near the rivers, but you can grow produce and that one takes away some of that necessity from having that relationship with the intercoastal centers or sorry, the inner valley um, centers. But then also he found evidence of um, obsidian. And so again, that also shows that ability and that capacity to somehow they were making that exchange and trade. But again, it shows that um, it was one challenge that, you know, this fishing community that was modest was, you know, subservient to the valley complex centers. And so it's trying to, I'm trying to like also join that conversation of saying that instead of having that idea that these small communities on the coast are subservient to these larger political centers, that maybe these relationships are relationships, like as um, Gabrielle's argued too, are relationships that they've chosen to enter into, whether for social reasons, um, maybe not out of necessity. So. We have other questions. Yes, Albert, go ahead. Sure. I don't want to. I don't want to get in the way of any students who might want to ask questions. So if there's someone else before me or anything, um, you know, feel free to take them. But um, I'm asking on behalf of uh, uh, folks who are non-Indianists and uh, you know, folks who are not oh, bio yeah. bio art folks. Um, <clears throat> I wonder about the uh, the percentage you found of interpersonal trauma. Um, <clears throat> And, and where does that sit? Like, is there a is there a threshold or a range that might indicate, like, um, you know, regular regular violence, whatever that you know may mean? Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, for, for the region or for okay, so the period or whatever. Yeah. So one of the things that I've been I actually just finished that chapter, um, the comparative data. So it's not perfect again because there's only two other studies that I'm really comparing my stuff with. Um, so in terms of another coastal population at the site of Buemape, we're seeing trauma rates that go closer to the 30% range. But again, that sample size is pretty small. It's like 42 uh, individuals. Um, and then another data set that I've been comparing to, it's, it's imperfect, um, but I think all comparative you know, studies are not necessarily always going to be perfect, but I did look at um, a study that recently came out that was looking at the Nazca Highlands, so that's in the south of Peru, um, and so it's imperfect because it's a different time period, and it's also a very different region and different social dynamics that are happening, um, but in that study, they looked also only at cranial trauma and made an argument that there was a time of elevated conflict and um, those percentages, I mean, there you see cranial trauma, um, not only in adolescents, but also in adult men and women. And again, those percentages go higher more towards like the 30% range. So in comparison to that, mine's like pretty low. And then again, for the, the modeling that I did, um, I, when I said, when you set that up, like you basically ask your models to perform against the null, which was like, mine was like one and none of my models outperformed the null. Like it was just like very not significant. So that was like another, that that kind of backed up my thinking. But then also when you just compare the peer descriptive statistics to other um, societies that have high trauma, it just doesn't compare. Thanks. Any other questions for Jordy? No? Well, please join me in thanking her and really appreciated your talk.